this channel is for you if you want to know what it takes to work with animals. Most weeks we interview an animal industry professional, somebody who has worked with animals. So that could be directly or indirectly. It could be with domestic animals or wild. If wild, it could be with wild species in captivity or in the wild. My guest this week is Graham Wellstead. Graham has been a lecturer at a land-based college in England, lecturing in the animal sciences. He has written books about animals, ferrets in particular, and currently he is a falconry instructor. Graham Wilsted, welcome to the Practical Animal Channel. Thank you and good evening to you. Graham, to begin with, please can you describe your career from the beginning to the present day? The very beginning, I left school at 15. My parents didn't have any great ambition for me other than they wanted me to be a postman because it was a steady job. I, however, wanted to be a veterinary surgeon, but didn't have the qualifications. And so I ended up going to the local job centre where they found me a job as an apprentice in the ironmongery business, which at the time I didn't even know what it was. Um, but I joined the company and was signed as an apprentice for five years. It was selling everything to do with building houses, except the heavy materials. And uh, eventually that job took me all over the world. I was selling door furniture, mostly to the Middle East. By this time, sales director of a company who only worked with overseas uh, contracts. And that kept us fairly busy until the building industry crashed and I was made redundant. And um, so I went around and found various other sales companies all had the same problem. And I gave up and thought I'll never work for anybody else again and set myself up as, a, as an instructor in teaching people falconry. This had a knock on effect, which uh, where somebody had heard that I was doing this and asked if I could teach falconry in a prison of all places. What we needed to do there was to set up a breeding program inside the prison which was done and it was very successful and once it was settled down and being run properly I moved on and went to a young offenders um, establishment where I was teaching and I had no teaching qualifications but um, I didn't appear to need one because there was no syllabus it was a question of bums on seats for three hours and keep them occupied which I did. Um, I was then, by this time, flying my falcons and hawks around the Meriswood Agricultural Estate, uh, which is a teaching college for all kinds of uh, architect and um, agricultural and farming practices, whether it be practical habitat management or um, animal care. The animal care department had um, a wildlife rescue centre which as far as I was concerned was unique and the person running it left and I was asked because I'd spent most of my life up to that point rehabilitating wild animals that had been damaged. I started with a, a tawny owl, uh, nothing wrong with it apart from the fact it was lost and uh, I went through with various birds and became a falconer principally because I was rehabilitating wild falcons and sparrows and kestrels and was successful with that from the age of 10. I was aided and abetted by an RSPCA inspector who knew no more than I did and we learned together and it was a fascinating time and I've carried that on right through my life and I'm still rehabilitating the occasional creature, only occasional now, but I'm still a practicing falconer and um, I went into teaching just to take over the running of the wildlife rehabilitation unit and doing one hour a week 
teaching from a syllabus which I didn't like, so I made up my own. The head of the department came and watched me teach one afternoon and sent for me. I went to his office. He shut the door and leaned against it and said he wouldn't open the door again until I agreed to work for him full time. So I became a full time animal care lecturer in animal sciences to my surprise. But of all the things that I've done in my life, that was without doubt the most enjoyable time. And when I retired from that, I missed it greatly and still do. What skills, Graham, does a person need to be a lecturer in the animal sciences, uh, in animal rehabilitation? Well, particularly with animal rehabilitation, you need to have some understanding of, of that to practice. And it's something that I think, is quite rare. I don't know of any other college that ran a wildlife rehabilitation hospital. Um, there may be, I, I couldn't say, but uh, I'd had from the age of 10 rehabilitated birds and mammals all the way through. So I had uh, a long history of, of practical application. And I think that you must have that practical knowledge first and foremost degrees and examinations there are none so it's, it's really practicalities nowadays would you say you need a degree to do what you did i'm sorry can you repeat that yes certainly would you say that nowadays you need a degree to do what you did no i don't think so um, of course, as, as, if you are teaching today, they like it if you have a, a suitable uh, degree, uh, like a, a Bachelor of Education. Mine was Bachelor of Science, but I didn't have a B.Ed. And um, so, but I never did because they, it takes three years to do that course. And when somebody asked me to do it by that time, I was too close to retirement. How would you describe the animal sciences education sector today, Graham? I think it's fairly fragmented. Um, as I've said before, I don't know of anybody else, any other college that's running a wildlife rehabilitation unit. They may well be working on practical habitat management and therefore that would include some care of wildlife in some form, whether it's just for the, the um, habitat, or I don't know, but I would think that it's a long way, it goes a long way towards it. Marieswood College had 2000 acres of beautiful ancient oak woodland, which was wonderful habitat for all kinds of things. And um, uh, it was a, a very good, example of somewhere to teach that subject because it had everything from every pond and there were a lot of ponds put in by the horticultural department over the years every one of them was full of newts and frogs and dragonflies and all all kinds all kinds of water creatures um, we went into the woodland with my students I used to take them the, the woodland was my classroom at certain points in the course. And uh, we would take plastic cups and bury them in the soil with a hole in the bottom because we didn't want something to drown. And I uh, found the most amazing range of creatures that were I never thought of as being in the woodland, and including um, greater crested newts, tiny ones. And that's where they grew up. Habitat is, is a lot to do with it, I think, and they must have habitat before they can do anything else. A lot of the land-based colleges in the UK nowadays have an exotic animal collection, a zoo, if you like, uh, attached to them as part of their animal management department. Uh, our department was quite broad based in its animal stock. Uh, they didn't go for a large wild animals, uh, but the nearest they got to that was um, rears and emus. But we did have everything from 
uh, tiny spiders through the tarantulas and snakes and lizards and, and various amphibians and, and so on to a, a large selection of birds from kookaburras down to budgerigars. Um, that's Australian only, isn't it? There are a lot of other things as well. Uh, then there are the small mammals, all the different rodents, hamsters, rabbits, gerbils, dagoes, rats and mice. The mice particularly were bred in large numbers to feed things like the kookaburras. And um, so we had a curator of animals who was ex one of the London based zoos and uh, he knew what he was doing and we had a very successful department. After I left, they, they had it re rebuilt, spent a lot of money, and it's like a palace. And I wish I was working in that environment now because it's, it, it, they really do have a, a, a fine environment. Whether everybody else is doing the same, I don't know. I doubt it. How do you see education in the animal sciences or animal management developing over the next 20 years? <sighs> I hope that it does develop, but I am very pessimistic about it because um, the, the problem is that there are very few jobs in the business of animals and uh, zoos and wildlife parks and rehabilitation centres. They, they don't really want to pay you they expect you to pay them almost because so the money is very poor so it doesn't attract uh, the best people um, perhaps although maybe the best people are those who are really prepared to do it for almost nothing because they do it because they want to and I think that's the way the education will go because it is a struggle to um, find work in any form these days but when I was teaching um, one of my duties was to interview the new entry every year together with their parents and one of the things that I would tell them was, was that work was going to be difficult to find and never highly paid and also whilst you are being taught, you're also going to get your hands dirty every day because you'll be cleaning and feeding all kinds of different animals and you will rotate through the various uh, creatures that we had. And um, the only difference between keeping elephants and keeping hamsters is the size of the shovel. Graham, what three books have most influenced your thinking? Well, initially, as a little boy listening to the radio, I was besotted with Out With Romany. So Romany's books, G. Bramwell Evans wrote a number of books, and they greatly influenced my early life because we used to listen to his radio programme where he was out in the countryside with two ladies, Muriel and Doris. And um, I really believed that they were actually in the countryside, in fact, because they were in the studio. But his, his work, which he was a fine naturalist, his, he greatly influenced me as a small boy, sufficiently so that when my father bred a litter of spaniel puppies, the first one born was mine, and she was named after Bramwell Evans's dog, Rack, which is the gypsy word for dog. And Rack or Racky was my first dog and I kept her until she had a heart attack and died at 12. So that was Bramwell Evans. Um, probably the next most important person to me, yes, the books of Frances Pitt, who was a lady who wrote in the 30s and did some very interesting work. And when I first started working with ferrets and I started the World's Ferret Society, I remember going to the Natural History Museum to see her collection of polecat skulls, which is part of my interest, because I was breeding wild polecats for release at the time. And but the but the third person who was a huge influence on me. Uh, not so, not so much his books, but his personality was the sound recordist Ludwig Koch, 
who was a German Jew who came here to get away from the Nazi regime in the 30s and appeared a lot on the radio in a program called Nature Parliament. But he also wrote some very interesting books and his own autobiography I have. And he was a huge influence on me because I would write to him at the BBC and he always responded. And so we had a constant correspondence and he was a great influence on me. And, um, and I loved him dearly. And his recording of a great Northern diver echoes in my, life, in my head throughout my life. It's the great Northern diver and the sound that it emits, which he recorded in a remote place in Iceland is quite breathtaking. Graham, what advice can you give somebody who wants to become a, a teacher or a lecturer teaching about the animal sciences, animal management? Do the groundwork. You must do the groundwork. Um, today you can go and, and, and take a degree in zoology or uh, something similar as I have done, uh, but you need to understand about animals before you start going because the degree doesn't necessarily give you the hands-on stuff that you need but it's certainly hands-on you mustn't be afraid to get your hands dirty or bitten and scratched i've been bitten and scratched by some mighty fine, fine stuff in my time um i've had a hole put right through the palm of my hand by a hawk um, when I miss, when I'm catching him in an aviary and he got one foot free, and he and he gave me the benefit of it. But boy, did that hurt! <laughs> I've been bitten by badgers, and and I've been my hands reduced to bleeding ruins by a, a roebuck that was caught up in an electric fence, and he twisted the tape around his antlers about twenty times. And it took me nearly 30 minutes to, to, to free him. Meanwhile, he, I discovered that not only are their hooves very sharp, so are the edges of their antlers. And I was in, in a complete mess. So yes, you've got, to, you've got to understand that you've got to get close to these creatures if you're going to understand them and, and then decide on what course you're going to take in, in as far as a degree is concerned and I would think you would need to seek advice um, it, it's almost like being but not quite a veterinary surgeon because you are repairing broken creatures and most of the time veterinary practices are limited to dogs and cats and guinea pigs and hamsters and to my surprise these days, ferrets. When I first took a ferret to a veterinary surgeon, he examined it from the other side of the room. And they also wore gloves that would have made a, a golden eagle handler uh, blanch at the size of them. But today, a ferret, I understand, is number five in the list of, of veterinary um, examinations so uh, people understand these things now but at the time i was doing it they didn't and um, but certainly hands-on is very important what can you tell us about the books you've written how many are there and what are the titles please graham oh um the first one i wrote i was invited by the publishers to write a book on ferrets so i wrote the ferret and ferreting guide in 19 79 and um to my surprise that was uh, a bestseller in its genre and it's st still available i think but no longer in print uh, the second one i did was a similar book but it was a rehash of an existing book so i rewrote one for the game conservancy on ferret management because I used to lecture gamekeepers and, and want would be would be gamekeepers at the Game Conservancy headquarters in Fording Bridge, and so they asked me to write uh, their ferret uh, uh, rabbiting book, which I did, and then I was again approached to write a book on birds, uh, birds generally, the caged 
the Cage Bird Survival Manual, published by Barons. And that was one of a series of books, uh, tropical fish, marine fish, all sorts of other things in the series. And I was required to, to um, follow the um, style of those books and write the same thing on cage birds. So that's a book with 246 birds in. Now I'm in the process of writing a book about my life from the age of 10 to 20 when I joined the army, which is what I missed out of my career. But, uh, but I was for four years, I was in the military police. Wow, and that's going to be your autobiography. It's only the first 10 years. And whether I'll live long enough to write the rest of it, I don't know. <laughs> how interesting, how interesting. Um, what, uh, what does it take to write a book, Graham? What's involved? Application. You can sit in front. I, my first one was in, sitting in a typewriter with a blank sheet of paper. And I, I started on the introduction and I was getting absolutely nowhere. And my publishers were getting a bit anxious and told me that I was under contract and could I please get my finger out. And so I sat back and thought, what do I really know about this subject? I know about breeding ferrets. So I wrote the chapter on breeding. And that opened the door, and then I went backwards and forwards through the book and finally pub produced it on time and sent off the manuscript. They then broke my heart by sending me back 30 pages of corrections. <laughs> and uh, that rather took the wind out of my sails, and I remember throwing it in the corner of the room and walking away. But then I sat down and looked at the 30 pages of corrections and, and they were right. I, it was mostly grammar and, and uh, punctuation, but things like how deep was the snow? Uh, I'd said in one point that my son and I were out ferreting in two feet of snow and then later on it was only a foot of snow. How deep was the snow? So accuracy is, that's what the editors are for. But So that was how my first book. And after I did that, I, I went on and I just wrote, rewrote the um, Game Conservancy manual uh, without any reference to anybody else. And it was just accepted and that was taken and that's still available today, I think. And the Cage Birds book, again, um, that was an unusual uh, um, thing because I was commissioned to write the book. But uh, because they were providing a lot of the information, all the photographs, because a photograph of every bird. And what was that book? Oh, that was the Cage Birds book, Cage Bird Survival Manual. Yeah, I've included Birds of Prey, because as a falconer, um, I'm a very devoted falconer. I've been doing it all my life, since the age of 10. I'm now 84, and I'm the oldest practicing falconer in the land, as far as I can understand. Are you really the oldest practicing falconer? I believe so. There were two others who were the same age as me, but they've gone. They've gone ahead of me. Yeah. What was the name of the ferret society that you started? It was the Ferret and Ferreting Society. It's still running under a different name. Graham, have you any advice, please, for somebody wanting to take up falconry? For example, the importance of finding a mentor. Yes, I think it's important. In this country, you can go and buy a bird, any bird. It can be a kestrel or it can be a golden eagle. It doesn't matter. If you have the money, you can buy it. There are no restrictions. There are certain papers that you require that must come with the bird in some cases. And there are two species particularly which are in such numbers that those papers are now no longer required. It was an EU document. I'm not sure what's happening since we've left the EU, but it was an A10. And the two birds that didn't require the A10 were the Harris hawk and the red-tailed hawk, both American birds. Now, I majored in red-tailed hawks for many years, but I also had a lot of Harris hawks. But you need a mentor to teach you. And in America, it is a requirement, but here it isn't. And it's very sad that people go and buy a bird and then don't know what to do with it. This, this, in the past week, I have just been 
to the north of England to recover a bird from a couple who'd bought a, a, a Harris hawk, but then did nothing with it because they were afraid to fly it. And uh, if you're going to have them, you need to know what to do. When I was teaching full time, which I'm not now, I had every species of falcon flown in the UK and every species of hawk. So whatever you needed to know about was there. But I used to start people with a buzzard because a buzzard has a mind of its own. It's not the easiest bird to train by any stretch of the imagination. It's not a great hunter, but can be if brought up properly. And uh, but it's a nice bird to handle and it gives you the opportunity to get its weight wrong without killing it. Because if you decided you'd like it because it's pretty and it sits on the fist nicely and it doesn't weigh very much and get yourself a male sparrowhawk known in falconry as a musket at four and a half ounces, if you get its weight wrong by a quarter of an ounce, you will kill it. It will die overnight. So not the bird for a beginner. Neither is a kestrel, which I believe is far too small for beginners. Today, we nearly always fly a Harris hawk as the first bird because of their availability and the ease with which they are trained. In many respects, the Harris hawk is the best thing and also the worst thing that's ever happened to British falconry. Why? It's the best thing because it's available and people who want to get into falconry um, can, can obtain a Harris quite easily. It's the worst thing because once you've got a Harris, most people don't move on to something else. So they don't expand their experience and go and fly a falcon or another, fa another, another species of hawk and, uh, and they stick to Harris Hawks. I went to talk to a meeting of falconers in the south of England one day, and there were 80 people in the room. And I asked them to put their hands up if they flew anything other than a Harris. The only two people that did put their hands up was me and the chairman of the group who was like me, a professional. Everybody else was flying the Harris Hawk and nobody had any chance of having a second bird. And so they couldn't fly a Harris and then something else. So it's a very limiting thing, but um, this is what's happened in the falconry world. I find it rather sad. If you were pushed to suggest, say, four ideal beginner's birds, what would well, you think? First, firstly, I would say uh, if you can find one a buzzard, because that teaches you weight control, and you've got it's big enough to, for you to take off too much weight without killing it. A, a female buzzard weighs two pounds, two pounds two, maybe two pounds four ounces. Forgive my old stuff, um, and you can drop her weight by four ounces, and she won't drop dead on you. You drop. A sparrowhawk's weight by an ounce and it'll die because it only weighs eight ounces and the male is half that. So the other one is the ubiquitous Harris hawk named after John Harris, who was a friend of John James Audubon, the famous American uh, artist who's there. Uh, Wildlife Society is the Audubon Society named after him. But John Harris was his friend and he discovered the Harris hawk and named it after him. So that's those two. From that, you would progress perhaps to a red-tailed hawk, which is the beginner's hawk in America because it's the only one they're allowed to take from the wild. We're not allowed to take anything from the wild. Um, but the, the red tail is bigger, stronger, and will take a surprisingly wide range of things. And my big female used to catch everything from mice to munchak deer. And uh, thank goodness she never tried to catch foxes. Uh, <laughs> after that, you might want to progress and go and have a proper falcon. 
Um, and I would suggest that the falcon you choose is the ladder falcon, which is a very well-mannered bird. It's nice to handle, again, big enough uh, to be uh, viable. Um, by the time you reach the stage where you can fly a ladder falcon or any falcon, uh, you have some experience under your belt and you know what's coming. Don't buy birds that are secondhand unless you can, can't avoid it. Um, always train your own. And this is why you should have a mentor behind you to make sure that you're doing it right. What's the name of your falconry? Way Valley Falconry. And Graham, is there anything else that you'd like to add? The dearth of, and I thought we were going to lose the barn owl. I was breeding barn owls and releasing them, but I was doing it rather differently to most people. And then I would breed young barn owls, set up a pair, put them in a farm barn under the auspices of a private landowner. So nobody knew where they were except him and me. Uh, we had a window in the barn so that they were captive in the barn. They could see out and see the world. Once they got their chicks in the nest standing up, then I would open the window and the male would fly free and hunt. And once the females decided to leave their babies, they would both be flying. So then the whole family would migrate into the wild as a truly wild set of barn owls. Most people were taking young barn owls and putting them out and hoping they would survive. What happened was that in, in the case of normal wild barn owl life, seven out of 10 don't survive to adulthood. This is normal. When you release captive bred birds, nine out of 10 didn't survive. There was no point in releasing nine out of 10 birds to just die. So we had a meeting with the government ministers, a license scheme was put in place to try and overcome that problem. But because the strictures of the license were so severe, that nobody applied. And so they dropped it and it's now illegal to release wild uh, barn owls into the wild. The other thing I've released is European polecats. I collected up a number of females from gamekeepers in West Wales where they were just about hanging on, bred them and released their youngsters in the areas around me in Surrey and Hampshire and along the Welsh borders. And uh, But now the problem is hybridisation with escaped polecat ferrets, which are the direct descendants. And they're having the same trouble now with the Scottish wildcat that is hybridizing with, with domestic cats. And so the, it's fine, difficult to find the true blood. And there we are, That's, those are the things that I've done in as well as. Can you, uh, can you speak about the, the Scottish wildcat at all, uh, its reintroduction, um, how is it doing? I don't think it's doing very well, simply because of the fact that it, it's hybridizing with so many domestic cats. I've lost track of the situation. The chap who uh, worked together, we worked together on a litter of cats. I had them here and they went up and were released in Peebles, but I believe he's, he's uh, passed over now, so I don't know what's happening. Something I've lost touch with, but I did enjoy my Scottish wildcats. Uh, they, and they do purr. And a famous author wrote that the way you could tell a wild cat was it had a letter M on its forehead. Every tabby cat there ever was has a letter M. The Scottish wild cat has a heavy clubbed black tipped tail and a letter M on its forehead, but so does next door's tabby. Was that famous author Mike Tomkeys by any chance? Yes, it probably was, yes. Graham um, Wellstead owner of Way Valley Falconry and wildlife rehabilitator and animal sciences lecturer. Thank you very much for being on the Practical Animal Channel. Well, I hope you enjoyed it too, because I jolly well did. Thank you very much.